Hi everybody, welcome back to the garden. Um, just wanted to give you a quick update on how the vegetable garden is doing. If you've been following along since the spring, I started clearing this land of raw forest back in, I think it was March. And here we are in July, uh, second week of July. And as you can see behind me, a lot of the things are growing pretty well. I've done a ton of work amending this soil. Well, first of all, clearing the land, getting it sort of the topsoil banked up into sort of raised beds, um, a lot of uh, logs and stuff like rotted wood and things underneath the soil to try to retain that moisture. And uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of maintenance to try, or infrastructure building, I would say, continuing to develop the beds. So on top of that, then I've had to amend the soil and biggest issue for me has been keeping this thing watered. It's been a really hot, dry summer so far. And this soil underneath is basically non-existent. They've got little, like I said, piles of soil on these beds, but underneath those and then underneath the logs is pretty well just sand and gravel. So the two issues with that are uh, moisture retention, of course, the water just goes right through it, doesn't retain it for very long. And then the secondary and probably worse situation is that the nutrients also flow right through and into the ground, into the subsurface, subsoil. And uh, that's not a good thing. So I've had to continue to add uh, compost pretty much weekly to all of, all of the beds to keep adding um, nutrients and also trying to add stuff that's going to retain the moisture better. So like I said, every week I add some more uh, composted manure, uh, straw, leaves from the forest, uh, soil that I've been digging up from the forest, um, any plants that are uh, getting to the point where they need to be harvested or weeds and stuff, I just chop those up and I put those on top of the beds as a mulch. So it's paying off. I'm really happy with the way the garden's performing so far. And uh, we've al already been eating some stuff from it, mostly zucchini and uh, what, peas, some herbs and lamb's quarters, which is a weed, but it's actually the, probably the tastiest thing in the garden right now. And there's lots of that that's coming in with the compost or with the uh, manure, compost of manure from our friend. I guess I'll start at one end and kind of work my way all the way around. So the, you'll see in the perimeter, what I have is hugel culture mounds, sort of uh, all the way around actually, all four sides, uh, delineating the garden, the vegetable garden from the forest. So this is my main strawberry patch here and you can see I've got nine plants in here. So pretty much all of the plants in the garden, I either started uh, with my wife from seed or bought them on, uh, online and had them shipped as uh, just uh, small plants or, or bare root stock kind of stuff. So I'm happy with the way all of these have come up, but um, like I said, all of the strawberries have been eaten by chipmunks as fast as they, as they mature. And the plants at this time of year should be winding down, most of them. And what they're doing as a result is they're starting to put out these runners. So that's going to be next year's plants and extra plants for me to root and then transfer to different parts of the garden. So I'm happy to see that at least. So all of these uh, pots that I have here, these are pots that my sister gave me, all the black um, flower pots basically is what they are. I transferred plants into these from the seed trays. You know, after I had finished planting out the garden, I had extras, so I just put them all in these buckets for now. And I'm hoping that I'm gonna get the greenhouse built before these things are so root bound that they don't uh, survive. Then I can transfer these into the deep beds in the greenhouse. If not, not a big deal. Some of these actually will start, well, you can see they're flowering and some of them actually have tomatoes on them. So they're gonna produce anyway. So I can uh, still harvest some food from these things, although it's just sort of overflow. Actually, I see I have a lot of caterpillars on my cabbage, which was otherwise doing well up until now. I have to get rid of these things. Oh yeah, moths on it, caterpillars. So unfortunately, I've never had um, success growing brassicas because the pests are, they, they're just more aggressive than I am, I guess. I've um, never been one to spend a lot of time on pest control, it's mainly because I don't spray anything chemical. It's all organic gardening that I do. But sometimes that doesn't 
well, lots of times that makes it more challenging, especially in a new garden like this one. I just don't have um, any history here. I don't have all the good beneficial insects and <clears throat> even the birds and stuff like that that will eventually will eventually um, take care of the garden. They'll, well, they'll be here in the same population densities as the pests so that they can control them. And then the other thing is I just don't have a big enough garden yet where I have redundancy. So I have all of my Brussels sprouts right here. I've got one plant doing well and four that are doing really poorly because they've been attacked by flea beetles and now this moth or moth and uh, caterpillar that I don't recognize. Um, same thing with this cabbage. Broccoli did well before it got attacked. We actually already harvested and ate some of that broccoli. And there's some more heads coming up, but like I said, they're getting pretty well attacked by these, these um, moths and caterpillars now, so I'm not sure how much more we're gonna get out of that. Anyway, that's uh, some things are gonna work out this year and some are not. This berm all the way along here it was one of my priorities this year. All of the hugel culture mounds actually. So underneath this is uh, rotting and fresh logs. And what that will do as they rot, they'll start um, releasing nutrients, but also retaining moisture. And I had to put this straw on top because the, because the soil is not very deep on these yet. It's going right down to those logs. Then it's very open down there and then just disperses. So I had to put the straw on, but these beds, Hugo culture beds, mounds, the intent with that was to get them established as long-term perennial beds. So along here, despite the fact that I've got a few annuals, it's mostly perennials. So I've got blackberries, raspberries, gooseberries. Um, not sure what elder berries I've got along here, elderberry maybe. So a few different berries along here. Then I've got apple trees near the end, four apple trees. So in the meantime, and then strawberries all along the front here, which are not doing all that great actually because I couldn't keep this bed watered. It just uh, was too much for me and ended up drying out and, and some of the, quite a few of them died. Um, anyway, I can use some of the cuttings from the other bed next year to transplant them into this area. So that's, to me this year, if I do get some annuals and get a lot of meals out of the annuals, but not, you know, a tremendous amount, but I get all the perennials established, get good roots down. Like here's a nice raspberry here, for example. If those do well enough and then they come back next year, then I'll be pretty happy with this year's garden, being a first year in this garden. So this is something that I never have success with. In fact, I wasn't planning on planting any this year, but uh, ended up finding some seeds in my seed bag from last year or the year before, and that's it, corn, uh, heritage corn. And then around that, I've got the beans, and I think, I, well, I've got squash right there, and I'll probably put one of the, trans, uh, transplant one of the squash plants into here. So this is basically like a little three sisters bed. And uh, I haven't had success just because the raccoons typically come in right before maturity and, and wipe it out this year. Um, I'm hoping that I'm going to be on top of the larger wildlife because I am hunting and fishing and trapping this area. So I'm hoping I can um, kind of keep um, those in check and end up, um, as they get attracted to the garden, I end up harvesting the, the animals and eating the meat of those. So it's sort of a win-win for me, I guess, not so much for the wildlife. Obviously, there's going to be lots of animals that um, I don't harvest that are going to benefit from all this extra food in the forest here. So because seeds are so cheap, virtually free, when you look at what you get out of a seed package, I ended up uh, just putting seeds anywhere, basically. So I had my established beds, and then I would just walk around with beans and, and squash, in this case, and cantaloupe, and you know, just all kinds of peas. And I would just throw the extras into the ground wherever I, I found. And the main reason for that is that I don't want any ground left bare so that weeds take over or that it continues to dry out. So something like this is actually protecting the raspberry bush that I planted behind it. Um, this is shading the soil and keep stopping this from drying out too quickly. And looks like I'm probably gonna end up getting some food off of it as well. So that's a, a win. Here's that lamb's quarter I was talking about shallow seed, uh, 
uh, rooted until you leave it for too long. But this stuff is really tasty. It's not bitter at all, so it's a nice salad green or um, spinach substitute, so you can saute this. And it does well in this heat where all the all the lettuces that I've been growing have gone either, they've either bolted, gone to seed, or they're at the point where they just taste too bitter. Too much latex coming up through the stem, and they're uh, not tasty, so I'm just plowing those under now and composting them. Now you can see lots of this seed from the straw. I'm not sure if this is wheat straw or barley straw, but essentially the seed head that's still left in the straw itself is sprouting with all this fresh rain. Despite the fact that it's been hot and dry, this week we've got like too much rain. It's actually uh, like r rainfall warnings and storm warnings. We've had some severe weather and now there's this uh, funnel cloud warning as well. So all this moisture in the hay or in the straw is starting to sprout the seeds. So I've got to get on top of these weeds and, and uh, other things that I don't want growing. Got to get on top of that and get it all pulled. This is one of my two potato beds. And this is starting to flower, which means they're starting to produce potatoes or will be producing potatoes on the stem. So instead of mounding with soil because I have a shortage, I just mounded all the straw up against the stems and they'll um, protect the potatoes so they actually turn grow into full-size potatoes without becoming green and, and uh, poisonous, toxic. Comes out rain. It's mostly open pollinated so and heirloom um, tomatoes. So we have some cherry type have some ones that are just called heritage. I don't know what the, what uh, breed they are. And, uh, I don't know what breed they are specifically. And I've got uh, San Marzano and a couple of others. Some sort of, sort of a uh, pear-shaped yellow tomato, which are all coming up. So anyway, I've kind of scattered those. So I'm trying to keep some patterns. So I'll keep all of one variety together, and then every second one in this row is a different variety. And they're all doing extremely well. Like this is probably way ahead of where, or not way ahead, but it's definitely ahead of where I've been in the past, even though I was two full zones. Like uh, I'm in 4B now, and I was in 5B before we sold our old house and moved up here. So I expect we'll be harvesting tomatoes in the next uh, second week of July now. So for sure by the second week of August, we'll have probably plenty of tomatoes, and then that will continue right up until frost and even after frost if we protect them so into october late september for sure and likely into well into october if we get a, a warm fall like we have been lately so i did stake a lot of the tomatoes here and here and some over there but the uh that's not very sturdy i need to get more stakes more tripods actually built here so probably tomorrow they're that 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 they're at that stage that i have to get them up off the ground or they're going to continue going horizontal and then when I straighten them out they might break so I have to focus on that tomorrow but these ones here that are staked and well pruned are doing really well they're going to be mature shortly and here comes the rain I'm going to have to pack this up and finish later
right, let's try that again. It uh, poured rain for like 12 hours, um, like monsoon. So good for the garden, not good for filming. Um, I'm not sure where I left off, but I was talking about the tomatoes. I know for sure, I'm pretty sure. Um, so different varieties. I think I have four or five different varieties of tomatoes. I have a super abundance of them, mainly because they were the things that were the most successful when we seed started. And um, we like to can them canned tomatoes, make sauce out of it, stewed tomatoes for a whole bunch of different meals that we prepare throughout the course of the year, like chili and spaghetti sauce and pizza sauce, um, salsa, uh, tomato soup, stuff like that. So never goes to waste. And then uh, 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 sun-dried tomatoes too for this with the small cherry tomatoes. So I'll keep you posted on this, maybe post a video every week or two now that things are changing rapidly in the garden. Uh, behind me, more tomatoes. And then throughout all the tomato beds, I've got other things growing with them, uh, companion planting. The marigolds that help repel um, insects that are bad for the garden, as well as attract beneficial insects. And pollinators in particular, especially with the, all these tomato flowers needing to be pollinated. I want as many bees and um, other types of insects that come in and, and do the pollination. And we have the odd hummingbird that comes in as well. Uh, but in these beds, besides flowers, there's onions and garlic, basil, um, chamomile, kind of spread throughout the beds. Uh, the garlic, I need to, I planted it this spring. Typically, you would plant it in the fall, but this garden didn't exist last fall. So I planted them in the spring and kind of late in the spring, too. Uh, but the scapes are at that point, so the part that comes up and forms the seed. If you cut that off, it'll put the energy back into the a bulb so it forms more a bigger bulb rather than putting all the energy into seed production so I'll just keep removing those and using those in uh, like for cooking uh, the leeks are not doing great so the leeks here are not doing great and I'm, it's one of the beds that I left sort of exposed I didn't uh, mulch it because it was hard to get mulch in here because the plants weren't growing big enough to actually do anything to mulch without covering them over. So it's constant weeding in this bed, which I'm not enjoying, but I do need to get mulch in there. Now that they're big enough, I need to cover this so that it suppresses the weeds. This is just not, I won't be able to keep ahead of them, especially now with all this rain. Uh, some of them are starting to grow. Like that one's actually looking like a proper leak at least. This, this bed kind of, I would say these leaks finally showing some progress i know what the problem is this bed has been way too dry right from the beginning this is the first bed that i planted in the spring along with a couple over there and this these should have been way higher by now but they just sat there for like two months not doing anything because of the dryness and it was just one of those beds that putting a five gallon bucket of water just kind of washed right down through the rows and then uh, into the ground and then just disappeared into the ground because it's so sandy to the drainage is just too good here so anyway i'll keep you posted on this like i said it's starting to show progress now so i'm happy about that um, and then so with leeks also you need to blanch them to get more of that white part of the plant that's tastier we do eat the top part the green leaves as well but they're re really coarse and fibrous so they're not uh, mo the most palatable a lot of people just throw them out but we like all the fiber in it believe it's a good part of our diet to get as much fiber as possible so we'll continue to uh, eat the green part but still want to get as much white as possible and that means blanching it by having having them half covered so that the sun can't get to, to that part of the plant and then it, uh, there's no chlorophyll production, so they go white. Look at all the weeds coming up in this center in the walkway. Just in the last few days, kind of went crazy. The weeds in this garden are the same. So this, this bed was planted at the same time as the leek bed and this was all beets. But what happened? It was so dry, like I said, so dry so early in the season that even though I planted them in like, what was it, April? Beginning of May or something like that? The beets all along this side, especially facing south where it was at the hottest, 
would just dry out so quickly that they bolted and went to seed almost as soon as they got up, which was something I've actually never seen before with my beets. So these, ironically, all these ones back here that are growing pretty well, they were seeded at the same time back in April and uh, they did barely sprouted, if at all, or germinated. And now they're up and doing well. But same thing, I'm still, like even with almost two days straight of heavy rain, this bed, you can feel that it's gonna be dry almost by the end of today. So I need to get more mulch up on top of this. And now that I can actually see where the plants are growing that I'm keeping, I can weed. Yeah, that's dry, man. Mosquitoes like this moisture. So what I'll do is I'll start, start to, as I weed, remove the weeds. I'll start mulching that to keep that moisture in. Mulch around each plant, at least. Keep the moisture at the plant itself. And if I have enough mulch, then I'll cover the entire bed. Now the other problem with this straw is that it gives the things like slugs a place to live in the I've seen a few snails here too. Right, little toads jumping around all over, so they're going to help with the insects. With the pests. So, beet bed. I, I think what I'll do too is there's a lot of vacant spaces here because a lot of plants did die or just bolt and I took them out. What I'll do now is get some more seeds started in here. Get uh, more beets going so that in the fall, I can harvest th them for storage. So I'll eat these ones when they're ripe and then store the rest of them that I plant late and harvest late. I just threw random beets and pea seeds all throughout the gardens as well because the soil is so poor this year for started, started garden. I don't have a much organic material built up. So I've been mulching with this straw but uh, to increase nitrogen, fixing nitrogen into the soil, these beans and peas, I'll just mostly just plow them right back into the ground and let the, let the nitrogen stay in the ground rather than pull the plant and transfer it to the compost pile. So this is the first uh, hugel culture mound that I built in the spring. Again, that would be what, March? March and April, and it started off a little bit higher than this, starting to erode slowly down and compressing. The um, problem with this is the same as the rest of the garden. I do have logs in the bottom of that, but that would have had a lot of air spaces as I backfilled it or put the soil in. And that's settling, but also creating air pockets that the water could um, get into and then just sort of flow away. That on top of the poor soil. so. Um, not enough organic material in here yet in this bed so it was really hard to keep it dry as well. This is south facing so this just I would put a plant in there or something would germinate and then it would die within a day or two because I couldn't keep it watered. So I just ended up throwing other things in here like the zucchinis that I knew would create a lot of biomass and also shade the soil so it wouldn't evaporate, water wouldn't evaporate as quickly. But same thing, I've got a lot of weeds in here. Some of them I've been keeping. I'm trying to pull them out just before they, they go to seed, but I'm trying to keep them because they're helping prevent the banks from eroding. So the roots are stopping the water from washing the soil away. But as I get proper plants that are edible growing, I'll keep removing the weeds, which are growing very quickly right now at this rate. You know, since this garden started off as a forest, these um, weeds that are establishing themselves here now would not be here if I didn't bring in all this mulch so and uh, compost. So that's the irony of improving your soil with outside materials that you end up bringing in pests. I've seen bugs come out of the composted manure, worms, which are not native to here, and all these weed seeds and grass in particular, like crabgrass, they're crazy. So that wouldn't have been here yet. In fact, nothing grows wherever I've cleared and, and didn't put any soil or didn't traipse over it. It's sandy, the soil is so sandy that nothing is growing, so not even weeds. So it, um, 
you know, it's catch 22. It'd be nice to not have any, like th to leave those conditions in the pathway so nothing grows up. But um, the other side of that is that then if I don't bring in that organic material, the plants won't grow either. The ones I want to encourage or grow. So it's a difficult um, balance, but it's definitely creating a ton of work for me trying to keep up on these weeds that I introduce, um, sort of as a byproduct of trying to improve the soil. Now, speaking of doing that, improving the soil and bringing in, bringing in uh, amendments for the soil, in the garden beds that I just created with the new pond, I'm not going to bring in manure, uh, composted manure into those areas, I'm going to try to use just all the native stuff. So um, I'll build up a compost or build up an organic layer by planting stuff instead and using that as a green mulch, green manure, and maybe some uh, get some mushroom stuff going too to get mushroom compost. But this, um, and wood chips, wood chips, leaves and stuff like that. This comfrey right here was a clipping for my sister, two of them, and that's growing really quickly and lush and that gets quite big and what I'll keep doing is just using that as a um, as an amendment for the soil so I'll keep composting that comfrey cutting it down and and laying that down as a mulch and as a as a compost to improve the soil so as much green manure as possible in fact I planted all along the pond and on the slope and by the greenhouse where the greenhouse is going I planted uh, peas and stuff like that that I can use to till back into the soil to improve it so a lot of the plant material that you're seeing on the mound is uh, peas and beans for that same reason just trying to improve the soil so a lot of um, nitrogen fixing uh, plants especially because the mound itself with all that wood in it that wood as it's decomposing is pulling nutrients out of the soil so pulling nitrogen out of the soil that the plants need well the beans don't need nitrogen they fix it from the air and this thunderstorm we just got last night too also fixes nitrogen. So that's gonna help this bed. But a lot of this, these beans then I'll probably, again, I'll harvest a few of the beans themselves and then leave some to dry. And as the plants die, just leave that right on the mound. So it adds a compost layer. So this is the beginning of my orchard back here along this line right here. I've got three different pear trees and on each pear, there's four different uh, varieties. Uh, Red Anjou, Kiefer, uh, Moon Glow, and Seckle. So three pairs, and then between them, I have blueberry, uh, three different blueberry varieties as well. And uh, they're doing pretty well. I need to comp or, uh, mulch those just to keep the moisture in a little bit more as well. But they're doing pretty well. The back of the mound here is facing straight north. And it's sort of where I'm doing my dirty work. So I've got a small compost pile here, a bunch of charcoal that I'm going to process into smaller pieces and, and uh, get down to a little bit finer, not quite dust, but smaller particles than I, that I can inoculate and put into the beds next spring or this fall probably. So the back of this bed though, because it faces north, I can plant things that like a little bit cooler conditions like spinach and some of the lettuces. So I can plant on the back of here and they won't, die or bolt too early due to the, the hot sun that it would get on the south side. So now that's sort of worked, but it's you can see it's not as not as much growth here on the back as there is on the front for obvious reasons, less sun, but also doesn't dry out as quickly. So what I'll be doing back here, see I've got some uh, That's all spinach that bolted early because it was too dry. So same thing, we've got beans and stuff like that back here. I also have stinging nettle all along this area here. It's something that could take over and uh, become a real nuisance, but I actually planted it intentionally because I want the stinging nettles for food and also for cordage. The long stems are um, good fibers, strong fibers for making natural rope. So the whole back of this, I'll let, uh, not the whole back, but part, halfway across the back, I'll probably let that sort of take over. And I can probably control it in the mound, especially on the north side, that's less ideal for growing things. I'll probably be able to 
keep it under control back here. The back row here of the orchard, I need to get these logs out of here. It's why I haven't finished this area. Get these out and maybe even mill some of them today. But I've got a cherry back here right now, which will become quite a large tree. It's one of the fruit trees that do well in this this uh, zone, which is 4, four B. Here goes the chipmunk. And then I have a wild plum growing here as well. So I think that's enough spacing. Then I'll do some other... Uh, this is a forest garden, permaculture. It's not the same as a, you know, an orchard or a, a regular market garden or something like that. It's going to be pretty rustic, pretty naturalized. So I'll have trees with and then shrubs and then ground covers all within the same area. So not within separate beds and um, let the plants sort of interact with each other rather than uh, try to keep sort of a sterile monoculture in each bed. There's a pest, there's a uh, caterpillar that's feeding on these cherry leaves. There's probably a few of them on there. So this is the east, east, um, uh, call it a hugo culture mound, and it's really long. It's uh, 75 feet long, and it's not very high. So I've planted my apple orchard here, and if you can call it an orchard, four trees. I might expand that, but I think what I'll do is plant others near the... Uh, pond once I get a fence to protect it from the moose and the deer there and ultimately the bears I guess when the fruit starts uh, being produced as the trees get more mature but uh, this mound not ideal place to plant tomato or uh, apple trees because the roots aren't that deep and if I don't continue to build up the size of this mound what will happen is the roots will probably dry out because they now it would be reaching the surface just as they go laterally because it's elevated and I got this slope on either side. So I'll need to bring this mound out probably probably double the size. Maybe even that amount this way and that way as well. And then I plan on having that sea buckthorn uh, hedge all along the back that'll become or grow that and some other shrub materials to get them big enough to deter the deer that uh, would be tempted to jump this fence. So that's a deer fence right there in the back. I think you can see it probably now with the lighting conditions. So, so far it's worked. I assume I've got probably no deer for sure. I've got them on trail camera and actually seen them going around the garden. And I uh, assume moose and bear have been through here as well, but nothing's come into the garden and done any damage yet. Well, because I have a fence, but still they haven't breached it. I know in this mound I mentioned earlier that it's all raspberries and other berries planted all along here as well and uh, strawberries along the front so hopefully they'll start they'll take and then next year they start producing. When I started forming this garden it was very uh, sort of organic the whole process because uh, this was a forest and as I would cut a tree down uh, whether I could get that tree stump pulled out of the ground or cut flush or not kind of determined where I put the beds and then the structure uh, lay of the land to start to reveal itself. So I'd shovel the soil into these mounds and then end up, ended up with beds the size they are. Uh, I had envisioned sort of a round circle in the center and having a water collection um, in the center of that, which I still would like to do. And then I was planning on collecting water off the Chicken Coopman workshop. But now the workshop location has moved completely away from this garden. And I'm not sure about the uh, um, chicken coop in this spot as well, but at the very least, I need to build some sort of work shed, uh, sort of a planting shed, I guess, to uh, uh, keep all the tools and do transplants and all that kind of stuff. So I'd like to do that and then collect the water off that roof. But that stump, as an example, I was going to just cut that sort of flush, make a little bit of a tabletop out of that and build a round you know, garden around it but now that it's become part of uh, right incorporated into a bed i probably will cut that flush to the ground do something different you can see these peas i think you can see them in the camera these peas are falling over because we had so much rain last night and they're really producing and the weight of those and the water starting to make them collapse a little bit this bed here that's the, my uh, potatoes i showed you already gonna be ready soon this here is sunchokes, Jerusalem artichoke. That is a perennial. 
I won't harvest those roots this year. I'll let this grow up, uh, mature, flower and everything, then die back. All the energy goes back into the bulb or into the uh, root tuber. And then uh, next year, this will be twice as big or more more, this bed. It'll be twice as prolific. And uh, then I'll start harvesting it and I'll move them around to different parts of the property as well. Yeah, in the meantime, this section here was available. So I've got some sweet potatoes in here that are doing all right. Really late start on those though. I just planted them a couple weeks ago. Then I have a couple of flowers in here. Um, over here, uh, right here, I have, that's just a flower. I forget a zinnia or something. For Oh, look at all the flea beetles on this. Holy smokes. I need to spray some organic, uh, some neem oil or something on that. This is uh, horseradish, and I planted it here because horseradish can get out of control too. But with this stump, all the mass of that stump and the roots underneath the ground, and then the raised bed, I should be able to keep it contained in this little spot and uh, just let this become just a patch of, or of uh, horseradish just right here. I actually like horseradish, especially with wild game. So I will be harvesting those next year for sure. <laughs> See, I have, I have to keep in mind road crop rotation and I can't keep these I can't plant tomatoes back in the spot next year because of the potential for disease and and uh, pests and depletion of the soil That's, that is specific to these crops is part of the reason you rotate so if these pull all of the phosphorus out for example out of the soil and then I try to plant it again next year there'll be a deficiency of phosphorus for them so I'll continue to rotate after this year, which means all of these types of plants, I have to move to a completely different area, but I have a lot of them. So it's an issue that I've planted tomatoes and peppers um, so, and potatoes all in such abundance that they've taken up the majority of the beds, which means they're not gonna be available for that next year. So I'll have to move all of these types of crops closer to the uh, cabin by the pond and then plant something else in, the, in these areas. Um, but anyway, that's why I did the plantings like I did here. So again, onions and garlic interplanted to keep pests away and obviously for food. And then got tomatoes on the back here, my San Marzanos, and then I've got sweet peppers and hot peppers here. I've got jalapeno, a sweet pepper there, and habaneros. So I like and eat a lot of peppers hot and sweet actually. So lots of peppers, lots of tomatoes in this area. These are marigolds again, that'll start flowering soon to uh, bring in beneficial insects, pollinators. So I'm happy with this. It's liking the moisture too, but also liking how hot it was. These peppers and tomatoes need the really hot weather to uh, really do well. This is my herb and medicine bed. Um, and it's a lot of overlap in that. Um, you know, whether, well, just to give you an example. So that's the flower bed. My wife really wanted that for uh, cutting flowers and uh, for bringing in like bees and, uh, and butterflies and stuff. And that's doing really well. This garden is more for medicine and for uh, herbs, but overlap being that this is echinacea cone flower. So that's a perennial that's going to fill this entire part of the bed. And that's good medicine, but um, also just looks like a nice flower, a perennial flower, especially for dry conditions. This is chamomile, which has got a lot of uses medicinally and uh, for nice uh, relaxing teas. We have the beautiful water beading on here, actually. This is all dill. Of course, you know what that's for. Uh, flowers across the back here. I have cilantro, which I really like in putting into something like a taco or a, a soup. I like the fish chowder that I make, uh, tomato-based or coconut um, milk-based fish chowder. That the cilantro really adds a nice flavor to. Here I have black-eyed Susans, which again are a medicinal plant, not just an ornamental. So they're doing very well. I planted one um, that I started as a seed inside, but a lot of these they just seeded directly and it's doing really well. It's gonna be full soon. Got mint, lemon balm, which has to be, lim mint and lemon balm have to be harvested aggressively because it's aggressive. It'll take over this area and it'll escape this garden if I don't keep, keep it under control and it is starting to get out of control. 
So I need to start uh, cutting that back and probably drying some of it too. To use for again for teas and stuff like that. It's nice flavor for anything, but uh, tea and a lot of health benefits to that, like calming your stomach, for example. And I've got St. Saint, Saint John's wort here, which will be a fair sized shrub. That is uh, medicinal. Rosemary, that's a herb, of course. Sage, lots of purple sage. I'm going to pull some of this mint back. Let the sage do better. Lemon balm and uh, mint are just crowding it out. These darn little caterpillars in here. I'm gonna kill them. Uh, we got basil, lots of basil, lots of parsley, thyme, things that I use uh, for cooking all of the time. And uh, here I've got turmeric. That's gonna be a root that I'll harvest. Not this year, I'll start harvesting it as it expands probably in the next couple of years. You can use that. I use that in a lot of dishes as well, actually. Very healthy for you. I don't know how many people know that um, this popular ornamental flower here that's in a lot of people's gardens especially or in trailing baskets this is um, nasturtium and it's one of my favorite edibles actually and it's covered in bugs too it's got a real peppery taste to it but what I like even more than the leaves is that is the uh, I'm just looking at the bugs on it well wow. What I like more than the leaves is the flower. So the seed that remains after the flower petals drop, nice little green, um, looks like uh, like a peppercorn sort of, and or a caper, and that's what we use it for. We'll pickle them and use them like capers. Just a nice little side dish with fish especially. Really, really like that. It's very peppery, very hot and spicy, which as you know, if you've watched me uh, putting hot sauce and stuff, I like spicy hot, hot uh, condiments. Thank you.